Hello class, today we're going to learn about the conservation of energy. So, the conservation of energy is a law. It states that energy cannot be created nor destroyed, energy can only transform form from one form into another, and this must take place within a isolated system. So if you really think about it, let's take a look at this law bit by bit. Okay. First bullet point, energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So that must mean that the energy that goes through your body in order for you to do things must have come from somewhere. And that somewhere is probably your food. Okay, so let's trace back. The energy that went into the food to be created, for example, if you're eating a piece of chicken, okay, the energy that the chicken needed came from somewhere, and that probably came from the bugs or the, the grass, whatever chickens eat. Okay? And so um, the chicken's food got their energy from somewhere as well, and that comes from, ultimately, the sun. The sun for our solar system is the source of energy, and it all came there from the beginning of the universe. So the energy we have here on Earth is the very same energy that we started off with since the beginning of time. It's crazy. Okay? And energy can only transform from one form into another. For example, if we take a look at um, a engine, Okay. In order for the engine to run and push the car or move the car, we need oil and gasoline. Okay, And those came from somewhere. When those combust, it turns from chemical energy into mechanical energy. So it transforms from one thing into another. Okay, uh, The very last point we look at is it must take place within an isolated system. So what that means is if we're taking a look at uh, a object. For example, if we raise a ball up a certain height and we drop the ball, as long as no other sources of energy enter into that quote-unquote system or that scenario, the energy that you start off with must equal to the energy that you end up with. All right, so I just mentioned a um, terminology before, mechanical energy. So let's take a look at what exactly mechanical energy is. So mechanical energy is the sum of both the potential energy and the kinetic energy. We're going to take a look at the potential energy in a little bit because we already take a look at the kinetic energy. Just as a refresher, kinetic energy is the energy that comes from motion. Right? Um, mechanical energy in general is the energy associated with motion. Okay, so it requires both potential energy and kinetic energy. Now, potential energy. We know what kinetic energy means. Kinetic energy means the energy of motion. Um, so potential energy, you could think about it like the, the other way. If kinetic energy is the energy of motion, potential energy must be the energy of not motion. Or, ah, oh, that's just a very bad definition. So let's take a look at it. It's the energy associated with the forces that depend spelling error, or the position or configuration of an object or objects relative to the surroundings. Oh my gosh, how confusing, right? But let's just break this down. So potential energy, we label it as PE for potential energy, or uh, I know it's going to be confusing, but we see it as U for potential energy, okay? So potential energy requires that there to be an object, and it needs to be somewhere. Wow. That just got a lot clearer, didn't it? Okay. So the class example is a brick. Okay. If we have potential, potential energy, in this case, we call it the gravitational potential energy. If we raise up the brick, we did work to that brick. And if you remember the work energy theorem, if you do work on an object, we give it energy. Now, because we raise the brick, we put the brick in another location, okay? In fact, we gave it a vertical location or a vertical height. So if we were to release the brick, when the brick hits the nail that you see there, it's going to do work on the nail, okay? So what happens is the work that you put into the brick, the brick is then able to use that, turn that into energy, and also do work. Like that. Crunch! All right, now I just mentioned the work energy theorem. So let's take a look at how this all ties in. Um, so the equation for work is force times the distance, okay? Uh, and we can break that up because we know that force is equal to the mass times deceleration. So work is equal to mass times deceleration times the distance that is traveling. Um, the equation for potential energy is mass 
times the acceleration due to gravity times the height. Okay, that's the simple way of remembering it. Um, the AP exam formula sheet will give it to you like this. It's the difference between the potential energy. So it requires two things, a starting point and an ending point. Um, and it requires a mass, the gravitational acceleration, and a change in height. So that's just a fancier way of saying mass, gravity, height. All right. So we know, according to the work energy theorem, the amount of work you do is the amount of energy you get. So in case of the brick scenario, the amount of work that we put into the brick by raising it is the amount of potential energy that we just gave it. Okay, um, And we know that if we plug in all the variables, it starts to look like this. Okay, And it looks like this. Hold on one second. You might be thinking to yourself, this is starting to look a little bit familiar. What if we change the acceleration in the left-hand side and saying, a, we substitute that for a G, and instead of saying D for distance, because we raised it, we call it H for height. Hmm. Now, if we do that, we find that the two are equal. That's where the equation came from, from the work energy theorem, right? Now, potential energy. Let's take a look at it. In order to determine if there's potential energy, you need to first establish what we call a zero line. For example, if my hand is the zero line, any object that is above this line has positive potential energy, and anything that's below the zero line has negative potential energy. Okay? That's a little bit confusing, but just think about it. Anything above, positive energy, because it can go from here to here. Anything below has negative potential energy. Now, there's um, other forms of potential energy, because potential energy is the amount of energy something can do. So for gravitational potential energy, is the amount of energy that, or amount of work that gravity can do to this object. In this case, we have potential energy for a spring. We have a spring, and we can compress it. We can exert our energy into the spring, squeezing it down, brother. Now, when we squeeze it down, we store this energy in the spring, and if we release it, that spring energy is going to shoot off that ball, and it's going to turn all of that potential energy into pew, kinetic energy. Okay, um, so this is the formula for a uh, force of a spring, and we have force of a spring is equal to negative k times x, and that is the equation that you need to know. Where k is what we call the spring constant. Basically, what k stands for is how stretchy a spring is. Okay. So some springs, like the shocks in your car, are very uh, very good at absorbing shock compared to like a slinky. Cool fact, the slinky was invented in order to be the shocks for a car. But obviously it didn't work out that way. Instead of, they made it into a toy. Okay. Now, the X is the what we call the displacement, or how far off it is from its starting point, or the unstretched Point. Okay, so uh, you can see in scenario B when we stretch it, we extend it out, or if we push it in, we compress it, and we can change the x in that way. Okay, now if you push on a spring, you you know if you exert a force on the spring, we we can stretch it or compress it further and further and further, and we what we find is the potential energy of compress or stress spring measured from its equilibrium point or the unstretched point can be written as like this: potential energy of a spring uh, is equal to one half k x squared, where k is the spring constant and x is the compression or the the stretch. Okay, or the, what we call the displacement. So if we take a look at this, one half something times something, that should ring a bell. Okay, that is the equation for a um, triangle, the area for a triangle, one half base times height. It looks just like that, and we get that because if we were to sketch a graph, a force times displacement graph, we would always get this shape. We would always get this spring shape. Okay, and that's how we know what the uh, equation turns out to be. Cool, huh? I think so. All right. Now, let's go back. Let's go away from springs and let's go back to mechanical energy. So, a classic example that we can always look at is the roller coaster. Okay? So, when you first get on a roller coaster, you're strapped in and then you're, you're hoisted up by a, a pulley system. Right? And then you go all the way to the top and when you get to the top, it goes click. 
click, click, click. And then you look at, you know, all across you and you can see the parking lot, you can see other roller coasters that you want to ride on, and then all of a sudden you fall. Ah! And so this is what this um, drawing is a uh, depicting. Okay, cool thing. Because energy can't be created nor destroyed, the only energy that you have for a roller coaster is at that first drop. Okay, how high up you go. So the higher up the roller coaster, the more energy you have. The more energy you have, the faster you can go. The faster you can go, the longer the waiting line is. It's true. It's true. Not scientific, but it's true. Okay. So here's another cool fact. The first drop is the highest point that you can ever reach because you can't gain energy throughout the roller coaster. So if the first point is the highest potential energy, you can't get any higher than that, okay, unless something pushes you. So if we take a look at this example here, um, at the initial point, A, you only have potential energy, right? And TME stands for total mechanical energy. So all the potential energy is equal to the mechanical energy. You fall. Ah! you fall, you fall, you fall, and some of that potential energy turns into kinetic energy. So at point B, when you're going around the loop-de-loop, -loop, you have some amount of kinetic energy because you're moving. However, you're, you're still higher up. You're off the ground, so you have some potential energy. You go through the loop-de-loop, -loop, you go to point C. Now, let's compare point C to point B. You'll notice at point C, it's lower in the height. So if it's lower, it has less potential energy, but more kinetic energy. Okay? Then you go and at point B, that is the most uh, bottom part, oops, the bottom part of the ride. And so you have no potential energy. All the potential energy at A is now turned into kinetic energy at point D. Okay? And then it goes forward and there's a whoop, a little, you know, a little jump. Uh, at point E, and so you'll notice that some of the kinetic energy turns into potential energy. So what that means is the more kinetic energy you have at point D, that is the fastest point that you will ever reach. Okay. Now, problem solving using conservation of mechanical energy. Here's a classic example. Uh, for one reason or another, you decide to drop a rock. That's stupid. Anyways, at the beginning, you only have potential energy. In this case, we represent that with the, the blue bar, okay? And as you drop it, it turns into kinetic energy halfway through, uh, and it's always going to be half and half. And at the end, right as it hits the floor, you're still moving as you hit the floor. Um, all that potential energy turned into kinetic energy. So how do we solve this mathematically, you might say? Well, you have to think about this way. Okay, what are, the, what are the things that we're dealing with? What are the mechanical forces? So the only force here is the, the force of gravity that's pulling on this rock down. Okay, so think about the before and the after. In the beginning, you raised the rock up and you gave it potential energy, but it had zero kinetic energy. You release it and all that potential energy turns into kinetic energy. Okay, and so the equation will look something like this. Alright, good. So, potential energy, O for initial, plus kinetic energy, O for initial, is equal to potential energy final, plus kinetic energy final. Okay? The left-hand side is always the beginning, the right-hand side is always the after, or during the part. Okay? Never the beginning. Right-hand side is always the after, left-hand side is always the beginning. Uh, from there, we can break it down into its various variables, and you'll notice how there are some variables with the O for initial and some variables with F for the final, okay? Um, the H's have the initial and the final because that's the thing that's changing, same with the velocity. So in a scenario like this, our initial velocity will be zero and we'll have no kinetic energy as depicted by the bar graph. So you will need to actually know how to depict uh, a scenario like this using bar graphs. All right, now in a case for a spring potential energy, okay, we have a pole vaulter. Um, that pole, because it's you know, elastic-ish, uh, you would just replace the potential energy, the gravitational potential energy equation with the spring potential energy equation, like so. Okay? Uh, and in this formula, instead of saying O's and S, they use 1's and 2's.